Thank you so much, Commissioner, for all your organization. I've had such a nice, interesting time since I've been here. Um, I spent the morning uh, talking about construction ground in general, and uh, this afternoon I want to hone in on this this uh, learning issue of how we learn uh, certain things that make semantic sense, but that we just don't say. Okay, so um, I think it's clear from a acquisition perspective what what learners need to do is they want to understand messages given the forms that they hear. Right? They need to do that for the sake of comprehension, and they also need to choose forms in order to express the messages that they want to convey for the sake of production. So that simple fact tells you that what learners have to do is they have to link forms with meanings or functions. And so what they have to do is categorize form function pairings. And that's what I mean when I say constructions. They're learned pairings of form with function. Okay, so I apologize to people who heard me in the morning, but um, constructions are then defined to include words because they're learned pairings of form with function. Also, um, what people often call morphemes can be viewed as, um, as words with open slots. So I'm adopting the lexical template view of morphology. Uh, idioms are clearly learned pairings of form with meaning. And idioms can be filled, like give the devil his due, or they can be unfilled, like to send him to the cleaners or her to the cleaners, them, and so on. And then, of course, um, more productive constructions, like the more you think about it, the less you understand, or the bigger they come, the harder they fall. Uh, you can put uh, many different kinds of things in those slots. And uh, so that's a very productive construction. And we also have the uh, unfilled construction. So the double object or ditransitive construction has no fixed morphology in English. Um, so he gave her a fish taco and he baked her a muffin, they're both instances of the double object construction. Okay, and finally, passives are, of course, constructions. They've always been called constructions. Okay, so what I want to focus on today is this question of how speakers learn when they cannot generalize a construction and when they can. Um, so how do we learn what we can say and what we can't say? So to address what pe how people learn what, you, what they can say, we can appeal to the input that they hear. Um, so people hear a lot of positive evidence in the input, um, and in this, in this, uh, under this heading, people have long talked about the, the effect of type frequency, variability in the input, variability of types, and uh, semantic coherence of the category. Okay. So in the work I'm going to briefly discuss under the notion of um, constructions as categories. We're going to look at that kind of input, and then we'll, we'll switch gears to the to the constraints, which will be more the focus. <coughs> okay, so um, in a little experiment or a set of experiments that I did with Laura Settle, they're a little embarrassingly um, explicit, uh, but but we found the results that were predicted by um, by this idea. So. Um, Okay, what we told people, this was on using Mechanical Turk, we told them very explicitly, assume you can say these sentences um, in, a, in a language, Zargosian, which isn't a real language, but we told them that assume you can say these sentences, how likely do you think it is that you can also say this sentence? And notice the first three, they don't know much about this. It's clearly some kind of construction because the word order is not English. It's got the verb at, um, in the front of the sentence, a little bit of morphology here, and then you can tell that there are two noun phrases, but the nouns are nonsense words. So the only thing they really have to go on here is the meaning of the verbs. Okay, and then we're asking them about a new instance of the same construction. And um, so we did four different studies, and people were asked to give a likelihood estimate of how likely it is that you can also say this sentence in the language. Okay, and what we varied, um, uh, and we used mixed linear models to analyze the data so we could keep, so we could look at the effect of items and uh, subjects at the same time. So what we varied was type frequency, that is the number of different sentences that we gave them. So we gave them between one and six sentences. And we also um, varied whether those sentences that we gave them um, came from the same semantic class or whether they came from three different semantic classes. So that's semantic variability. And then we also varied how close the target utterance was to the 
to the sentences that we had given them. And the generalization that accounts for the data the best, I think, is involves this idea of coverage. So if you imagine that our that the exemplars you witness are represented in some kind of very highly dimensional um, similarity space uh, that includes lots of dimensions of similarity of semantic similarity. So say you witness two cases, so one exemplar with a particular form A and another exemplar with the same form A, and then you're asked about a potential new coinage. How likely is it that you can say this one? This is the green one. The idea of coverage is that what people do is they form um, a convex category that includes all three of those exemplars. And then basically the question is, how densely is that category covered? Okay. So that idea, so in this case, there's a lot of white space. We've only seen two examples, so you can't be very sure that this is a productive category. But that notion of coverage um, isn't something I made up. It comes from the non-linguistic category literature. So in generalizing for categories, people, and this, this is work that comes from um, Jan Osherson and colleagues. Um, again, the, the idea was that uh, coverage involves the degree to which a category has been attested. Okay, so in our little toy experiment, if you give people three examples and you ask them about another case, and I should say the semantic similarity was determined using this online LSA measure, just for simplicity. So in this case, the category is relatively not well covered. We only have three cases. So coverage is relatively low, and people correspondingly judge the sentence to be less acceptable. When you increase type frequency, that is, you increase the number of different verbs, you necessarily increase coverage. Um, and that led to judgments of more acceptable, that the sentence was more acceptable when you increase the type frequency. But if the case to be um, judged was very dissimilar, so in one case we used verbs of cognition compared to verbs of all physical manipulation, so appreciate in terms of semantic space is way out there, then the category that you need is correspondingly really big. And you haven't seen it attested in much of this space. And, and in fact, people judge this uh, kind of example to be less acceptable again. You know, we saw this before, and this was judged to be relatively acceptable. But if all of the six cases come from one semantic category, so they all cluster tightly together, then again, you can see that asking about a different case that lies outside of that cluster involves, again, reduced coverage. Okay. So the lack of semantic uh, variability of attested tokens inhibits generalization if the new instance falls outside of that cluster. Okay, so the idea of coverage just combines known factors of semantic variability, uh, similarity of the potential coinage, and type frequency into one idea. Um, but those factors have been around for a long time and have been found to be important in different ways. Okay. So that's really all I'm gonna say about the positive exemplars. I think what happens is we categorize the tokens. And then we're just asking, is this category well tested? Is it that will tell us whether it's productive? So semantic and phonological categorization goes a long way to explaining which new instances sound acceptable. But again, we're going to talk about things you shouldn't say. Okay. Now there are certain things that we know you shouldn't say, like you shouldn't say, I haven't seen you for a long time. Are you pregnant? <laughs> or I only care about my grade in this course. Or I'm sorry, officer, I didn't mean to get caught. And those are all things that you shouldn't say, but you shouldn't say them for pragmatic reasons. You'll, you're bound to get you know, an unpleasant response uh, if you do say these things. What, what we're more interested in are um, certain kinds of odd gaps that don't, don't elicit this kind of horror response, but um, still native speakers just avoid them. Okay, so um, this is one kind of case, while it's fine to say she told him the story, it's odd for native speakers to say she explained him the story. While it's fine to say she, he hid or banished the rabbit, it's odd to say he vanished the rabbit. While it's fine to say she wanted or hoped or planned to go, it's odd to say she considered to go. And while it's fine to say the astute boy or the sleeping boy, it's odd to say the asleep boy. Okay. 
So these are all what I, I have question marks here because they're question mark for native um, speakers of American English. But these are exactly the kinds of mistakes that non-native speakers regularly make because they make perfect sense. And in fact, there are lots of attested examples like this. So there's, it's not obvious why you shouldn't say it or how you learn not to say it. Okay, and we know that um, caregivers do not reliably give uh, direct feedback. And you know, that's obvious when you think about it. So you know, if a kid says, me loves you, mommy, it's unlikely that the mother's gonna slap the kid and tell them that they pronounced it wrong, right? Instead, the mother hopefully is gonna hug the kid, right, and give them positive feedback. And conversely, if a very um, precocious young child says, I have just completed a colorful mural on my bedroom wall with indelible markers, the kid is not likely to give the hug and, and um, you know, and uh, compliment their grammar. Instead, they're likely to be punished for this. So, of course, caregivers respond to the content of the utterance much more than the form of the utterance. Okay, so how do people learn? The prevailing uh, view, especially among usage-based researchers, and I count myself among usage-based researchers, the prevailing view has gone something like this. That in a situation where you see this, um, you're going to hear, he disappeared, that man disappeared, he disappeared. And that that will simply be enough to tell you that um, you shouldn't use disappear transitively. You shouldn't say she disappeared something. Okay, that is, you hear disappear, and you hear it used intransitively, and you just by hearing it intransitively it should tell you that you don't use it transitively. Okay. Um, so this idea is what I'm going to refer to as conservatism via entrenchment. So conservatism basically means people produce what they heard. If you haven't heard it, don't produce it. So they're conservatives. Entrenchment refers to the aspect of this idea which says frequency matters. So if you've heard something a lot, then you should be more reluctant to extend it than if, you, than if it's a low frequency verb. Okay. Um, so again, people use verbs only in ways they've heard them before, that's the idea. And high overall verb frequency predicts grammatical inflexibility. And in fact, there's some evidence for that. And we'll come back to this, I, this fact, but um, when, when you ask for judgments, it's not a huge effect, but people find reliably in many studies that the first sentence is judged to be less bad than the second sentence. Okay? Now, they're both novel. We don't use either verb transitively, but um, people are more willing to extend vanish than disappear. And do you see how that follows the prediction, right, that, well, vanish is less frequent, so you've heard it intransitively less often, so you're more flexible with it as compared to disappear. And we're holding semantics <clears throat> constant here. Like. So we also found this result, and I will come back to it, but um, there's something about conservatism that I, I found dissatisfying, and that was that people can be creative, right? We do use even frequent verbs sometimes in new ways. So, um, here are some examples of creative speech. Uh, these are all attested. So I grabbed the guy by the collar of his flowered shirt, popped him a punch. Or a 15-year-old Googled his way to revolutionizing cancer detection. Or Michael, Mike couldn't believe she had managed to flirt his wallet open again. Where um, uh, you have these verbs and you've heard them. You, you've never heard them in these constructions, probably. And yet, you know they're acceptable. They really don't even sound that odd, right? OK. So, is there another way to think about this that also involves frequency, but it's not just that people tend to stick to what they've heard, full stop. And I think maybe um, a useful idea involves statistical preemption. So, this idea is that um, what you hear matters, but what, what matters is what you hear in particular contexts. So, it's not just that you hear disappear that often. Um, so, okay, the idea of statistical preemption is that people learn to avoid certain formulations by systematically witnessing a competing alternative when they might have expected to hear one formulation. That is, the idea is that it's not the intransitive, the simple intransitive uses of disappear that are relevant. The way you learn not to say she disappeared it, I would say, is that in context where disappear is, involves um, a cause change of state, you don't hear it genuinely. So it's this kind of context, because here, how would you say this? 
Right, make him disappear, exactly. So imagine the learner is uh, either planning to say the magician made the rabbit disappear or the transitive, which is remember is not acceptable, the magician disappeared the rabbit. Well, reliably, they're going to hear the paraphrastic causative with make. Upon hearing it, that's going to um, increase the association of the, of the paraphrastic causative with this kind of context. And we'll see, I'll talk about the mechanism later, it's going to decrease the, acti the activation of the um, transitive disappear if it had been activated. And over time, right, that kind of thing, you're going to hear make disappear a number of times. And that's going to eventually make, make you associate the make paraphrastic with um, causative instances of disappear. Okay, so there's a, it's a subtle difference from entrenchment. Um, but when we come back to this example, the explanation is not that you hear it disappeared a million times. It's that you've heard he made it disappear more often than you've heard he made it vanish. Okay, so the nice thing about statistical preemption is it allows that people can be creative sometimes. So they can extend verbs to new uses as long as there isn't a readily available alternative. So that's the key idea. If, there, if you're in a context, you pull the readily available alternative off the shelf. If there is none, well, you have no choice. You come up with something creative. Okay, so I think I explained uh, what's here before. So that is disappear use transitively sounds bad because every time it might have been appropriate, you hear make something disappear. And make something vanish is just heard much less often. <coughs> okay, so many verbs alternate, right? This idea has been, had been, of course it's true for morphology, I should say, for words. We know it's true, right? The way you learn not to say feet is that, um, or foots, is that any context where you might have expected to hear foots, you systematically hear feet. And so feet blocks or preempts foots. So I, I'm just arguing that it scales up. Um, now, in the case of construction, so this idea was raised and it was dismissed by like Pinker and Melissa Bellarmin because they pointed out correctly that constructions typically have different functions. So hearing, um, hearing a word in one construction shouldn't tell you that you can't say it in the other construction. And that's true. So lots of times verbs are used in multiple constructions. And when they are, they have slightly different meanings. So verbs like break are used both transitively and with the paraphrastic causative, make it break. And so are verbs like melt. So you hear them in both constructions. But in the case of vanish, you only hear it in one construction. And the idea is you even hear it in this construction when that construction, with all things being equal, be more appropriate. You just don't say it. So the fact that these two constructions have been in competition in actual con context and you only hear one case tells you that um, make something, or sorry, it's somebody vanish something is unacceptable. And the more you hear it just in one construction, the stronger your inference is that you wouldn't say it the other. Now there's a, this raises an interesting question when you think about the idea of coverage. So what you're learning here is that the right way to express this concept is here, right, with the, with the paraphrastic causative, and not here. And one question that comes up is, do you actually categorize restrictions? So do you form a category of things that you don't say here, you only say here? Okay, we'll come back to that. I think there's some evidence that you do. Okay, so again, each construction does have its own function. I, I would be the last person to deny that. But that's not a problem for statistical preemption. It can actually be viewed as an advantage because what it means is that there will be contexts in which one construction, call it construction A, should be preferred to construction B because of the context, because of its function. But if in that kind of context, you systematically hear construction B, then that's really good evidence that construction A is not appropriate. Okay. So um, I did an experiment with uh, graduate student Clarice Robinell, where we looked, at, we, we revisited that idea that, um, that vanish something is better than disappear something. So, <coughs> Um, she asked, are high-frequency verbs always less flexible? So the idea of conservatism should say yes, right? If it's more frequent, it shouldn't be used in other ways, period. But statistical preemption says, 
it should only be, the bird frequency should only matter if there exists a competing alternative. Okay, so what um, we did was we generated pairs of sentences that varied only in the main verb. So for instance, um, pairs like this and pairs like this, where the, the meaning is pretty much the same, but embarrassed is, is higher frequency than more advanced. And in this case, coat is higher frequency than douse. And then we have a separate group of people, um, basically, uh, well, okay, we, we said, if there's a better way to say this, write it down. And what, um, and then we saw the paraphrases people came up with. So if you were had to paraphrase this one, the editorial embarrassed the poor man out of town, how would you paraphrase it? Just shout something out. Shame. Okay, I want the whole sentence though. Well, so the editorial. Well, okay, or, <laughs> or or made him leave town because he was embarrassed, or um, right? There, there are many paraphrases. You know, 20 of you will come up with 15 different paraphrases. That's the idea, that there's no readily available alternative to this. There are other ways to say it, but they're all different. There's no off-the-shelf formulation for this. Now, if you were asked to paraphrase this one, the chef coated ranch dressing over the salad, what would you say? Covered. Well, covered. Okay, actually, we told them to keep the verb constant. Okay. Yeah, the chef's coated the salad over the ranch dressing. Yes. And that's what the majority of people came up with. They all produced the same alternative, which, again, was the chef coated the salad with ranch dressing, okay? So we bring the sentences using this Mormon study into two groups of um, pairs of sentences. One class had no competing alternative, that is no standard competing alternative, and the other class did have a competing alternative. And we had um, seven pairs of each type. Okay, and then we collected acceptability ratings with a different group of people and we just ask them, is this sentence, you know, on a scale of one to five, how acceptable is it? Now, with this, we included not only these novel sentences, right, which are ungrammatical to varying extents, but also baseline sentences. Baseline sentences are sentences in which the verbs are used in their prototypical argument structure frame. Okay, so mortified is usually intransitive, so we included that. Now, they should all be very acceptable. Okay, and what we did was we, um, again, used a mixed linear model so we could take into account, because remember the sentences are really different in terms of their meaning and sometimes a little bit in terms of their length. So we took uh, length and semantic features of the verbs and plausibility as fixed factors as well as subjects and items. So here's the data, and I'll go through it piece by piece. Um, so again, these were self-reported native speakers. Um, okay, so the baseline sentence. These are sentences used in their usual way. Um, higher frequency verbs, uh, like she was terribly embarrassed, are more acceptable slightly than low frequency verbs, she was really mortified. Okay, you expect that because there's an advantage to things that you're very familiar with. Now, interestingly, um, that's reversed, as other people had found, for the disappear or vanish cases. Um, that is, Vanish used transitively. That's a, well, it wasn't that example. So coated the um, the salad dressing onto the salad was rated worse than doused. Okay, just as other people had found before. But if the sentences had no competing alternatives, so these are cases like the um, embarrassed the poor man out of town, then verb frequency doesn't matter. Now I will say um, I will say that uh, there's a main effect clearly of between the baseline sentences, right? Like of of these categories. So the baseline sentences are much better than any novel sentence. Okay, and then to that extent, entrenchment is right, right? Like we do prefer the types of sentences we've heard before. So that's why you know these are so much higher. But if the sentence is novel. That's these, both of these cases. And it matters if there's a competing alternative. Okay, and the frequency of the verb in the competing alternative matters to your judgment. Okay, so the idea here, if we use those <coughs> diagrams we started out with, is that if two constructions are competing, like we saw before, hearing um, a verb only in one gives you indirect evidence that it doesn't occur in the other. And hearing it more frequently in one gives you better evidence. 
But if the uses aren't in competition, if they don't mean the same thing, then hearing it all day and all night here doesn't tell you anything directly about whether you can extend it there. Okay, but yet um, it is true that familiar formulations are preferred to no novel ones, all things being equal, right? The baseline sentences are there. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that people do prefer to use familiar formulations, but we are willing to use verbs creatively when we're in a new context, when we need a new formulation. Uh, the frequency of the verb in competing constructions is what is relevant to Isaac. Okay, so I'm going to move on to adjectives, where we have a little experimental evidence that this idea of statistical preemption plays a role. Okay, so there's a subtle restriction on A adjectives. It's a small group of adjectives that start with an unstressed schwa, like up. They don't like to appear before nouns. They don't occur in attributed pre-nominal position. So it's odd for native speakers to say the asleep child or the float ship. Um, and it turns out this is not a general semantic restriction because New York synonyms are fine. It's fine to say the scared man or the sleeping child, but we just don't use those A adjectives like afraid and asleep this way. It's also not a simple phonological restriction because there are other A adjectives like the adult male or the acute sickness that are fine. So it's not just the unstressed schwa. The, um, the answer is that, that's, I mean, the, the <laughs> The motivation for this small category is historical. So these A adjectives in Old English were prepositional phrases. That a uh, was a preposition. So in Old English, it was in sleep or in bloom, on drift. Okay? And as prepositional phrases, they wouldn't be expected to occur before nouns. Right? We don't say the on drugs man. But of course, people don't know the history of English. And so that's not why we're not doing it that way today. So we need an explanation for how people learn it today. But what it does tell us is that this is why the statistics um, were originally the way they were in English. And the statistics and the input kept getting perpetuated over generations. And we still obey the statistics and the input, even though we don't know the historical facts. Okay, and it turns out that afraid never was um, a prepositional phrase. It was a past participle of afraid. But people seem to have assimilated it to the category of the adjective. So again, synchronically, that is in today's speaker's mind, it seems to require a usage-based model that speakers are aware of which adjectives they've heard in which constructions. Okay, and um, they also, so constructional generalizations emerge, emerge from learners categorizing over that input. Okay, so there's a study, they're very, it's very quick to explain, three uh, related studies that I did with Jeremy Boyd. Um, and uh, I revisit this now because it's recently been challenged. There's a new paper coming out in language by Charles Yang. So I'll, I'll explain that, and I'll explain our counter argument to hurt him. But the original study looked like this. It was a production task. Um, we had undergrads using, we tried to make the um, task as naturalistic as we could. So, um, okay, so what we were interested in was, do novel A adjectives like affect? nonsense word. Do they get assimilated to this category? And we also want to know, does statistical preemption play a role? Okay, so people saw screenshots like this. Uh, two identical animals, they were labeled with um, descriptors like dead and alive. And we read those out loud and we told people, here are two foxes. Then one of them moved to the star, the screen went blank, and we simply asked them which fox moved to the star. Now notice, in answer to that, they could say, the dead fox moved to the star, or they could say the fox that's dead moved to the star. And we're interested in whether they use these adjectives pre-nominally or whether they use them in a relevant clause. So there were four conditions. We had um, real A adjectives like asleep. We also had near synonyms like sleepy. And then we had nonsense A adjectives like adapts, and nonsense non-A adjectives like chammy. Okay, now if you're if you've ever you know, read um, production studies or any kind of psycholinguistic studies, you know you have to worry about priming in this. If people produce, you know, one formulation, they're likely to keep repeating it if they can get away with it. So there's this persistence with that. So in order to knock people off of either always using a pre-nominal formulation or always using a relative clause, we had counterbalanced fillers in between this, the experimental items. 
So it turns out that if you're using prototypical adjectives like bad, good, smart, and dumb, people always use them attributively. They never say the cow that's bad moved to the star. They always say the bad cow moved to the star. But if, and then we also included present tense verbs, and we told them you, you have to use these words just as you see them. Notice you can't say the bites dog moved to the star. You have to say the dog that bites moved to the star. So this ensured, and in fact it, it worked, it ensured that people were sometimes producing relative clauses and sometimes producing pre-nominal adjectives. Okay, before each of these three little experiments, we did this, um, we can think of as a, as a uh, an exposure plot. So we told people, okay, we're going to do this with kids, so um, I'm going to give you some practice. Bear with me. Because, you know, the task is so easy, it seems silly to do it if you didn't mention kids. So in the practice, um, in the practice trials, we, in, we used some ad adjectives um, attributively and some others in a relative clause. Okay. And then we did the production task after that. Okay. So what we find is that so in experiment one, I should say, the um, practice block included adjectives that were not in the rest of the study. So, and there were three of each, so it didn't bias them one way or the other, so that was just baseline. And what we find is that um, people do resist using real A adjectives pre -nominal. So this is the um, y-axis is the percentage of pre productions, the number of times people said the, uh, um, the asleep cow moved to the star. And they do it a lot less than the near synonyms for the sleep. Okay, so that's a, um, a significant difference. They also produce effect less often than they do chan pre -nominally. So there is some effect. These, these nonsense additives do get sucked into the category a little bit. But if you're looking at the y-axis, you might notice that the effect is much stronger for the real additives. So now they're both together. And it's, there's a strong interaction that um, the effect is stronger for a sleep. Okay. So in a second study, we introduced in that exposure block a little bit of preemptive experience. So now um, people saw cases of, uh, there, there were, they saw two novel A adjectives during the exposure block, and uh, as well as other cases that had relative, uh, other adjectives that had relative clauses. And this time they heard the fox, so here you might say the fox that's effect moved to the star. Okay? Now that's a preemptive context, because all things being equal, we know we use adjectives before the noun. But by using the relative clause, we're indicating indirectly that you don't use this A adjective that way. <coughs> okay, so again, the exposure block was exactly the same as before, but now we use two of the four nonsense A adjectives in a preemptive context, which happened to be the relative clause. So the first experiment, remember, looked like this. Second experiment looked like this. That is, uh, in fact, there was no difference after that little bit of preemptive exposure between the novel adjectives and the familiar ones. And in fact, if you look within the category of nonsense adjectives, there was no difference between those that were exposed in a preemptive context and those that weren't. Meaning, that little bit of preemptive exposure made them classify all the nonsense adjectives as part of the A adjective category. So they, they assimilated the restriction to other cases. Okay, so remember, we raised this question before, is it possible to categorize non-occurrences? It seems that it is. Okay, now, um, we were a little worried by this strong result, because we thought, gosh, you know, people shouldn't be so quick to use preemptive exposure. Um, and so we did a third experiment that also looks at, that could be viewed as um, testing the idea of conservatism. So, what we asked here, now we presented people with what we call the pseudo preemptive context. What we wanted to know is whether people were savvy enough to know when a context was truly preemptive. So the pseudo preemptive context was this kind of sentence during the exposure block. So here you might say, the fox that's a dax and proud of itself moved to the star. Now why is that pseudo preemptive context? Do you see? You do, okay. Because you're proud as well. Because what? You're proud as well. Right, because you couldn't say the uh, adapts and proud of itself box. So there's an independent reason to use a relative class. So it doesn't tell you anything about that. Okay. So the the pre-nominal attributive construction isn't available for the proud of itself box. 
So then you can't say the effect in crowd itself box. Okay. So if people are being rational and they recognize this is pseudo preemptive, then they should ignore it. This is the results in experiment one, and this is the results in experiment two. They do rationally ignore it. So people are smart about what counts as a preemptive process. All right. So it looks like so far learners record the statistics of their language, they categorize their input into patterns. Statistical preemption is the idea that learners learn to avoid certain formulations because an, because an alternative formulation is systematically used in the appropriate context. And um, learners are smart about what counts as a preemptive time. Okay, so the challenge to this idea comes from um, Charles Yang, uh, and he uh, adopted a view that Ben Bruning had written on a post on a blog. Um, Okay, but Yang's, Yang's um, critique of those studies on AI attitudes is kind of interesting. So he did a corpus study and he argued that um, kids don't witness enough evidence for statistical preemption before they're three. So he looked at those AI attitudes like afraid and asleep. He looked at, a, I think, a four million word corpus and said, you don't hear them in relative pauses and that. Um, and he also offered positive evidence. So he said, look, learners don't need this indirect negative evidence of statistical preemption. Um, he claimed because the AI adjectives pattern like particles on up and out. How, you, one, you might wonder, do they pattern like particles? Well, the claim was that um, they, the AI adjectives were said to occur with adverbs, including certain adverbs like right, straight, well, and far, which also apply to particles. Okay, so here's, the, you know, we'll start here. So we have the A adjectives, let's put them in a separate class. We know what typical adjectives look like and we know what they behave like. Now prepositional phrases we have, and then we also have particles. Now, if we don't have indirect negative evidence that is necessarily statistical, we need some kind of positive evidence to say this group is like this group and not like this group, right? So, do adjectives actually occur with those adverbs? Well, it turns out, no, they don't. So, like, not at all, basically. Um, the other is well aware, but that's the only one that occurs with any regularity whatsoever. So you can't say it far asleep. And if you look at the 450 million word coca corpus, which is 100 times bigger than the corpus that Yang looked at, you never see this, it never happens. Um, and regular adjectives do sometimes occur with these, with these uh, adverbs. So the adverbs don't tell you, if we go back, it, the adverbs don't at all tell you that this class patterns with this class. Right? Because the adverbs sometimes occur here, never occur here, and freely occur here. So, okay. Why did he think that it might? Well, he classified um, across, away, around, and ahead as the adjectives. But I would say those are locative particles. Okay, so if we, um, here's the actual data. So using coca, again, it's a huge purpose. So if it ever existed, it would be found in coca. Yeah. You know, 450 million words is about what a typical college freshman has heard in their lifetime. So the, the adverbs we're talking about very rarely occur, again, with the exception of well aware. But they, they do occur sometimes with other adjectives. Okay, and in any case, um, particles can occur in pre-nominal adjective position. So you do hear things occasionally like the near future, the past year, the outside world, the inside track. So even if they were like particles, they wouldn't tell you why they don't occur before nouns. Okay, so um, is there any evidence that A adjectives are adjectives? So I'm calling them A adjectives, but is there any independent evidence that they're adjectives? So I would say it's tricky. I mean, it's hard to divide things into grammatical categories, but the borders aren't that clear cut. Um, but semantics is a key, right? The semantics of these things clearly is adjective like. A phrase designates a non locative property. So adjectives as a class, that's what they do. They, they, um, they designate a non locative they also passed the classic test for adjectivehood um, 
which isn't perfect, granted, but you know, we can say he seems asleep, he seems afraid. We wouldn't say he seems under the table, or he seems up. Okay. Um, and if you look at conjunction, like typically adjectives, uh, sorry, typically when you conjoin two things, A and B, A and B are of the same semantic category, the same category, grammatical category. Not always, again, not always. But if you look at the adjectives, they much more commonly combine with other adjectives when, or rather than uh, prepositions or particles, okay, which happens. You can say, um, what's the one that was pretty common? Um, oh, I don't remember where these higher numbers come from. But occasionally you do get a preposition, but um, <coughs> mostly you get adjectives. You get these treated like adjectives. Bruning had a slightly different idea, which is worth mentioning. So Bruning suggested that these A adjectives were like um, indivisible prepositional phrases. So alive is like at ease and on fire. Okay. Now, you don't use at ease or on fire pre-nominally, so that's a good idea. Um, but we know from psycholinguistic work that actually um, whether subparts of a word are analyzed depends on the frequency ratio of the part to the whole. So if, if you look at it this way, we know that people do recognize at ease as involving at and ease because at occurs as a preposition a huge number of times compared to at ease. Ease also occurs a huge number of times compared to at ease. So in the case of at ease, the parts are really identifiable. You've heard at separately, you've heard ease separately, so you recognize it as a prepositional phrase. But in the case of um, afraid, well, you never hear a uh, as a preposition or a particle. It's never used that way anymore. And, and most of the um, roots um, aren't used as nouns, so we don't talk about fray or where or live as they're not nouns. So it's a lot less clear that you there's any reason to treat that the children would know that they should be prepositional phrases. Okay. And then what about Yang's observation that three-year-olds don't have enough evidence to, to learn this restriction? Um, there I concede the point. They don't. And guess what? Three-year-olds don't know the restriction. So I had an undergrad for a senior thesis. She redid the same kind of experiments we did. And what she found was she tested kids of huge number, like kids from between 6 and 17. The non-A adjectives, um, like uh, sleepy, are the lighter top color, and the A adjectives, like afraid, are the bold face. And what I want you to notice is that these two don't come apart. Kids are using them like almost, you know, 50-50 until they're 10 years old. When they're 10 years old, they start to systematically be more likely to avoid the A adjectives. So that's what you expect because you don't get a huge amount of statistical preemptive evidence for these, as Yang pointed out with the formerly word corpus. Kids probably need 10 times as much input or maybe even more, and they don't get that till they're, till they're um, 10. Okay, so that's just to say that statistical preemption is consistent with the available evidence. Okay, so now let's move on to the uh, mechanism. The mechanism is, uh, I think, kind of intriguing. So it's clear from huge amount of work that when that we're always anticipating what others will say. Um, so that's true, you know, for eye tracking studies when you're hearing something, or you, you know, you can often finish other people's sentences. But a lot of this is unconscious. So the idea is that um, if you anticipate like explain in the double object construction, then it should be partially activated. Um, and if the competing form is witnessed instead, what happens, even at a neural level, and it happens behaviorally too, is the competing alternative wins, and not only does it win, but it suppresses the, the, for, the potential of number one pair. And that leads to two preempting one. So I'm going to mention some experimental evidence for this idea. But, but in general, um, construction that's in competition is weakened whenever another form wins, that is, is produced. And if competing construction is not partially activated, then there isn't any suppression. So, okay, so um, colleagues of mine did this really interesting um, study where 
they are interested in statistical preemption and this idea of um, blocking in a very general way. So what they did was they showed people a sequence of faces and scenes and places. And um, so it turns out when people have seen these two faces followed by this scene, after even one exposure, they come to expect it. Okay? Now, down the line, they see those two faces again, but they see something different, not the same scene. So C and D are different. So what preempts what? I mean, I mean what, what would you expect? That the idea is that D preempts C. So you form this expectation to maybe expect C, but if you don't see it, then C is going to wind up preempted by D. So after that exposure, and it's just sort of passive exposure in the scanner, they, um, they had people do a recognition task. Do you remember this or not? Have you seen it before? And they're comparing. So the C cases are now um, cases that were in this position that were blocked or preempted. Okay. So these, this is an example of C. Here's another one here. So you can see A and B are, are identical down below, but instead of C, you see this other thing, D. Okay. What's interesting is that um, people are worse at even remembering C in these, after these kind of trials. They've seen them the same amount of times. It's not a matter of how often they've seen them. But hearing some, so expecting something and hearing something else instead dampens your response to this thing you So when do kids generalize? When does, you know, preemption is, is slower, right? Because this takes a lot of input. Um, but kids generalize and, and over-regularize and, and um, um, scale back from overgeneralizations at different ages. It depends on the construction. So they have to, um, they generalize as soon as the tokens are recognized to form a pattern which can be different for different constructions. Right? For simple past tense, they're flooded with lots of evidence that does forms of past tense. So they're going to be producing the past tense more productively early. Um, same with plural. But in the case of these constructions, like they have to recognize the double object construction, and they have to amass enough kinds of tokens to generalize. There's a lot to do here. I mean, you know, this work has been done a lot for morphology, for the formal regularities, but it hasn't been done a lot for constructions. Um, and I, you know, I'd love to see a lot more work being done because kids have to, they don't generalize, you know, blindly, they generalize along relevant dimensions. And it's our job to figure out how do kids figure out which dimensions are relevant. I think that's a really hard problem. Okay, so why do kids overgeneralize? In the case of words, we have some ideas. So kids often, when they're very young, will learn the word for, say, dog. And then they'll start calling everything a dog, uh, every animal a dog. Um, or they'll learn the word for ball, and then they'll call all round things a ball. Okay, so that's the kind of overgeneralization that happens a lot with kids. It turns out, though, um, it was a really clever study done by a number of people, where if you show kids that are doing that in their productive language, you show them pictures like this, and then you say, show me the dog, they reliably know that at least this is a better example of dog. So why are they using dog to refer to these? They don't have anything better. Yeah. So yeah. So it's the same thing. You know, why do you say it's the phone box of cappuccino? They don't have that readily available alternative yet. You know, maybe maybe they've heard um, pig, but it's not as accessible at this moment. So the idea is, you know, you do try to pull the readily available alternative off the shelf. If you don't have one, what are you going to do? You stretch your existing category. And then again, how do children eventually recover from these overgeneralizations? The idea is, well, the more conventional alternative becomes more readily available through more exposure and greater fluency. OK, so I think, um, right, I think you know, I've gone through these. There's one thing I didn't talk about, which I'm happy to discuss in the question period. Um, but uh, um, yes, so let me just. Um, Thank you, Mena and Daphne. You guys have been terrific. Uh, and thank you to the audience for your patience today.